banks created the financial crisis, it'll last for years and we're all paying the price. As a country, we're at least 5% poorer. poorer. And that is a consequence of the banking crisis, crisis, crisis. We may have bailed them out, but the banks are still doing what they want. It doesn't seem sensible to have a tiny collection of banks that can hold a country to ransom, ransom, ransom. They're still paying huge bonuses, and they're still fighting off reform. They have too much political control. They have too much effect on competition. competition. Dispatches reveals it's business as usual for Britain's banks. The new government's promised to get tough. It'll need to be to beat the bankers. As taxpayers, we've poured more than a trillion pounds into bailing out Britain's banks. But that's just for starters. The hope is we'll get most of that back. But the wider damage is stupefying. The Bank of England say that the output lost now and in the future will cost at least another trillion pounds. The austerity, the spending cuts and tax increases that lie ahead have one principal author, the banks. But while we confront a decade of austerity, banks and bankers are reveling in a new prosperity. Rescued by taxpayers, they're back, making astonishing profits, buying and selling the very financial products that caused the biggest banking crisis in living memory. That's why a working paper circulating inside the Bank of England right now warns that without radical reform, a second crash is close to inevitable within 10 years. But instead of shoring themselves up as any other industry would after a near-death experience, last year the bank has paid out £6 billion of bonuses. And even that number has been skillfully massaged down, as city pay consultants and headhunters have revealed to dispatches. It's smoke and mirrors land here. Chris Roebuck used to be in charge of global recruitment for the Swiss investment bank UBS. He is now a city headhunter. What's really happening is that they are altering the way they're paying people so that they can say to the public, we're actually paying lower bonuses, but most of the people in the organisation are actually getting just the same money as they were before. No industry compares to investment banking in the amount that's set aside for pay, typically 40% of the money that's made, an extraordinary industry norm. All that has changed since the crash is the balance between bonus and base pay. Barclays, what they've done is they've significantly increased the base pay of some of their people, which means when the figures come out, the proportion that's bonus has actually dropped. Other pay insiders confirm what is an open secret. When I'm talking with my clients about different options, always in the background is public awareness or public perception. Sean Springer advises banks on what they should pay to get the people they want. The fact is, it hasn't changed. The basic salaries, which shall we say, an individual earning a million pounds was get a hundred thousand pound basic salary and nine hundred thousand pound bonus. Today they're getting three hundred thousand pound basic salary and a seven hundred thousand pound bonus. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that the status quo was worn out. Jonathan Chapman is a leading expert on city pay. It's faced with saying no to pay demands or disguising them, he says, bank managements have plumped for disguise. A managing director in an investment bank might typically get a base salary of 150,000. Now that has increased, we're seeing numbers of anywhere between 350 and 450,000 for base salaries. All they've done is adjusted down bonus pools slightly to pay for that. So if it gets them a, a better deal with the regulator or, or better relationship to meet certain regulatory requirements, then of course they're going to do that.
the regulators want sanity in banking, more profits held back for future crises and less diverted into incredible pay settlements. But the banks are playing cat and mouse with them, as they always have. It's a dangerous game for us all. The way bankers and traders were paid and are still paid is that they have an incentive to take a huge amount of risk. And if things go right, they pocket the profits and the bonuses. And if things go wrong, the worst that happens to them is they don't have that bonus. Nouriel Roubini, a former advisor to President Bill Clinton, was one of the few top economists to warn the crash was coming. He finds today's lack of changeover pay terrifying. Either way, the public loses and the bankers do well. And that's a distorted system that actually leads to the kind of financial instability and crisis that is becoming severely damaging. The problem with these guys is that a lot of them have just got into the mindset where you pay mega salaries and everybody else is doing it, so it must be all right. Bankers constantly told the former chancellor banking is so special, they have to pay top prices for what they consider top talent. No other business in the world would reconcile themselves to that. In fact, most businesses are always looking at way of cutting costs or saying to the staff, no, we're not going to pay you all this money. It's a cultural change that's needed in the banking industry and, you know, frankly, I don't see too much sign of it happening. It may seem incredible that a banking system that faced meltdown nearly two years ago is able to pay such large salaries and bonuses, but it's got little to do with the banker's business savviness and everything to do with the torrent of government guarantees and cash handed to the bankers. Just take the most recent profit figures. Barclays first quarter profits, 1.8 billion, up 40% on last year. HSBC doesn't release quarterly profits, but says they were very good. And Lloyds repeats that things are on the up. And even loss-making RBS report that in the same quarter, it made an operating profit for the first time since the crisis began. 713 million pounds. The banks benefited in part from a desperate but necessary experiment by the Bank of England to get money circulating and the economy moving. Under so-called quantitative easing, it printed £200 billion and in effect gave it to the banks. People didn't really know what quantitative easing was going to do. David Blanchflower was a member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee when it decided to print the money. There was a twin hope, get the banks working and help business. What we were trying to prevent happening was the Great Depression. We would have in our minds that 20% unemployment, the death spiral downwards. So that was the first thing, rescue the banks, get them lending, get rates down, do everything you possibly can. But most of the money hasn't reached British companies. The bankers have used this near free money from the government for business as usual, lending on property and speculating in the financial markets. It's made it much, much cheaper to be a banker, much easier to get hold of the money, and it's actually made um, their profits much, much higher as a result. Economist Giles Wilkes has become one of Britain's top experts on government finance. Since contributing to this programme, he's been appointed an advisor to the new coalition government. Imagine if the Chancellor, at the outset of this policy, had stood up in Parliament and said, I will use um, the taxpayer's balance sheet to make sure that these privately run banks make massive profits for the next year and they will be able to keep it and give it out to their shareholders and give it out as bonuses to their staff. There would have been outrage. But in many ways, that's what quantitative easing has achieved. British banks portray themselves as world-beating financial alchemists. But the bailout, the near free money from the Bank of England, the guarantee that government will bail them out if they go bust, hasn't shaken their opinion of themselves. These are people who sit at desks in front of television screens 
two telephones in their hands, shouting at each other. They, on the whole, think that they're quite talented. Coal miners made his fortune in the city, and until four weeks ago was city minister in the last government. The banking industry actually has received more state aid than any other industry in the UK economy. When we talk about state aid, we tend to think about farming and agriculture, and we think about the defence industry. But the industry which has received more state aid than any through the guarantee that they won't be allowed to fail, a guarantee for which they pay no premium, uh, is the banking industry. Easy profits, personal fortunes, not all that hasn't changed. In the run-up to the crash, extreme risk was the currency of success. Bankers gambled, they lent, they dreamt up new products, and the more successful they were, the more it justified still more gambling. The key to these bets were financial derivatives, products so complex the bankers could hide how risky they were. Almost two years on, they're still playing this lethal form of banker's roulette. Derivatives are essentially cheap bets in which two parties, banks or companies, gamble on future movements in financial prices. Supposedly, they help the buyers or sellers manage risk. Some do, but many are no more than invitations to speculate on a massive scale. For British banks, it's a one trillion pound business. Dispatches commissioned its own research into how much each of the big four British banks are betting. 30% of Barclays' assets rest on derivative bets, 416 billion. For RBS, it's 20%, 421 billion pounds. For HSBC, 10%, 174 billion pounds. While for Lloyd's, it's 5%, still 49 billion. This is a trillion pounds of risks, some tiny, some huge. The size of derivative trading is still huge out there. A lot of the profits the banks are making today is still through derivatives trading. A recent IMF working paper describes how the world's top 10 banks, including RBS and Barclays, have taken advantage of the freewheeling shadow world of derivative trading to do what would otherwise be impossible. Together, the 10 have risked $1.6 trillion of money they don't have. That's 1.1 trillion pounds. The IMF don't say it, but one mistake, and this behavior could trigger a second panic. Derivatives are kind of very dangerous weapons that have to be controlled in the appropriate way. We have laws to regulate the use of guns. We should have laws to regulate the use of derivatives. We're ready ring fence and backstop and bailed out financial institution to the tune of several trillion dollars. That's why it's so important to do the policy change that's going to avoid the next crisis. We were barely able to afford this crisis. We cannot afford another financial crisis. At that point, you could have another Great Depression if that were to happen. Coming up, the secrets of the bank's lobbying effort. Dispatches reveals how and how much the City of London Corporation spends on promoting the UK financial services industry. And we unveil new research that questions how much the banks contribute to British society. The story the industry itself has been telling is a story about social contribution, which presents finance as the goose that lays the golden eggs. It creates jobs, it pays taxes, but I think when you look at it, none of this actually stands up to empirical scrutiny. For more than a decade, British banks and big finance have told us they're special. They're world beaters. They can make money out of money. They're a race apart. 
This is an era that history will record as the beginning of a new golden age for the City of London. And I want to thank all of you for what you're achieving. And the politicians fell for it. This was Chancellor Gordon Brown's last speech before becoming Prime Minister. And we will always recognise that your international success is critical to that of Britain's overall success. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now. The bargain that banks pick up the profits while the taxpayer picks up the losses is grotesquely unfair. Yet Big Finance still insists it deserves special treatment because its contribution from jobs to taxes is so pivotal to the British economy. To test those claims, Dispatches commissioned its own research from Manchester University's Centre for Research on Sociocultural Change. The team examined the claims Big Finance makes about the amount of tax it pays and the number of people it employs. Total direct taxes paid by the much trumpeted financial services sector, including corporation tax and national insurance, were £193 billion in the six years up to 2008. But the untrumpeted manufacturing and productive industries paid almost twice as much, £378 billion. Financial services are significant, but not so much they should put everything else in the shade. Check the figures and put them in context and see things are not quite as they appear to be. So if you ask what is the net social contribution, quite clearly the answer is the net social contribution is negative. Carol Williams is one of the directors of the research team. The story the industry itself has been telling is a story about social contribution, which presents finance as the goose that lays the golden eggs. It creates jobs, it pays taxes, but I think when you look at it, none of this actually stands up to empirical scrutiny. And what of those claims about the number of people it employs? In 1991, financial services employed a million people. In 2008, despite a boom in profits, it still employed a million people. Meanwhile, the bank's failure to lend to business, down by 40 billion this year, is causing huge concern. There was certainly frustration expressed by a number of people at the bank, especially about if you help these banks, the condition of helping them has to be that they'll start lending. And essentially, that's not really happened. You own RBS, you own big chunks of Lloyds. How come they're not lending? But British banks are being true to type. They've never lent much to business. In the decade before the crash, just 3% of banks' net cumulative lending went to manufacturing companies. Another 18% went to other productive industries. But around three quarters was lent for home mortgages and commercial real estate. I think that if you look at banks and lending, you have to ask, historically, what have they lent on? And the short answer to that is, they've lent not for any productive purpose at all. This is the finance sector working for itself and inflating asset prices in an unstable way. They have no track record of supporting anything that's usefully productive. I don't think one should fall into the sort of real men only do manufacturing uh, to a uh, line of territory. Adair Turner is chairman of the Financial Services Authority which regulates banks. Mortgage credit performs some incredibly useful functions, so indeed does lending against good commercial real estate development. But it is quite striking when you look at the UK figures over the last 20 years how commercial real estate lending uh, just exploded and we know that that has been a cause of major uh, banking crises uh, for decades and actually what the banking system does for instance with the manufacturing sector is the sector pretty much deposits into the banking system uh, as much as it borrows uh, from it banking is not the special industry it claims to be 
Our investigation dramatizes just how much banking has departed from its roots and entered a new world in which the object is to make money from money. It's about faceless transactions and not relationships, despite the efforts the bankers make to paint a different image. The banking adverts portray a world hard to reconcile with reality. You know that bit of money you've put aside? Not doing much, is it? No. It's banking as we'd like it to be. Safe, stable, supportive, and above all, totally trustworthy. Wherever you want to get to, Lloyd's TSB is here to help you on your journey. Over the last year, we've helped more than 50,000 customers get a new mortgage and helped over 80,000 new businesses get off the ground. Since 2004, our Money Sense program has taught over 400,000 school children about money management. It's just another way we're here for you. At HSBC, we want our customers to prosper. So right now we have special offers and advice to help achieve your financial prosperity. It's an image the bankers work hard to project, not least in Westminster and Whitehall. The self-confidence of the city after what we've lived through is extraordinary, as if nothing had happened. It sees itself as Britain's champion industry, mysterious, rich and super successful. It is, you know, a very strong myth and a very strong part of international identity. British investment banking, dear boy, is always the best. The British fell in love with being the world leader of exporting financial services because it looked like, you know, Eurovision Song Contest or England in the World Cup. Hey, we got a world beater. An American economist living in the UK, Adam Posen is an external member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. Have we been tough enough with the British banks? Probably not. We've been tougher than, say, the U.S. was and certainly than Germany's been. And by nationalizing, you forced some costs on shareholders and some costs of management, which was right. But tough enough in the sense of really making them change their business models, making them fully accountable for what happened, breaking up their cozy relationships and their privileged positions? No. Privilege remains undimmed. We all face tax rises and decimated public services to pay for the banking crash. But when bankers ring the Chancellor to press their case, he takes the calls, personally. When I announced the bankers' bonus tax in the pre-budget report last year, uh, I received lots of calls, actually, uh, uh, from lots of bankers. And curiously, uh, they appeared to be speaking from one script. Uh, which rather suggested that there was some, some degree of, uh, of uh, collusion beforehand. What, you know, I think banks basically... And what uh, were they saying? They, well, they didn't like it. Of course they didn't like it. And, you know, they, they said, uh, you know, this was um, causing them to think long and hard about London and all the rest of it. As the banking crisis intensified in May 2008, the then government launched an inquiry into the city's future. Every member of its government-appointed membership had a background in finance. Its chairman was Sir Vin Bischoff, now chairman of Lloyd's. Despite the banking crash, it concluded that almost nothing should change. This is finance reporting on finance. In the old days, when you had a report on finance, the Macmillan in the 30s, Radcliffe in the 50s, Wilson in the 70s, all these reports had a broad range of social constituencies, industrial employers, trade unionists, and academics of different kinds represented both on the committee and in giving evidence. All of this vanishes with Bischoff. I don't think that the Bischoff report was probably our finest moment as a government and perhaps would have been helped if it had a few people uh, from outside the finance industry. The team who wrote the Bischoff report included four representatives from the City of London Corporation. The Lord Mayor, two former mayors and a senior elected official. The City of London is an extremely powerful institution, perhaps the most effective lobbyist, I think, in history. It's a city government that represents one interest alone, which is the financial interest. 
Maurice Glassman is a long-time city watcher. The city still acts as a state within a state. The Prime Minister has to meet the city if it asks for it within 10 days. The Queen has to meet the city within a week if it requests it. So the city has this extraordinary power within the institutional framework of the United Kingdom. Best known for its quaint ceremonial and with its roots in the medieval guild system, the Corporation of the City of London is in fact a local council like no other. It's part elected by residents, part by representatives from city firms, part paid for by the business rate, part by private income. It's the local authority that provides public services inside the historic square mile and a voice for big finance, including the banks. A public institution with private money, a potent mix. There's no other public institution in Britain that has the resources that the Corporation of London has, the undeclared assets that it owns um, that are absolutely unique in our country. So it can afford to promote its interests in that way. And the accounts of those undeclared assets, which pay for much of the city's lobbying for finance and the banks, are not made public. But the next councillor offered to show us what was in them. We have seen his return to the throne before which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that this is Jesus the Lord. William Taylor, an Anglican priest, sat on the City of London Council for a total of five years. I watched it at work very closely. I went to the dinners and I saw the, the lobbying functioning effectively. The Corporation City of London sees its role precisely to advocate the interests of the banking system, the body of Christ. William Taylor has shown dispatches accounts of what is known as the city's cash, the confidential records of the income and expenditure from the city's vast and historic property empire. They reveal that as recently as 2008, the corporation had a private income of nearly 130 million and funds of nearly half a billion. Nearly 8 million was spent on the Lord Mayor, who boasts a diplomatic passport to help promote UK finance. Another 3 million is spent on undisclosed economic development and policy initiatives. The city's cash is used as a large expense account to resource particular pieces of lobbying that the, that the city wants to pursue. The City of London does uh, pay think tanks to produce reports and to run events. It has an office dedicated to keeping an eye on what's going on in Parliament and lobbying national politicians. It's a, it's a very well-resourced um, lobbying institution. I make no pretense about the fact I promote the city. I am representing my borough. My borough is financial services industry plus about 9,000 residents. Stuart Fraser is a stockbroker and chairs the corporation's powerful policy and resources committee. He's recently been involved in creating a new group of banking industry insiders to present the city case. We have a new regulatory group that advises us and also will feed into the Treasury, yep, is entirely financed by the industry. You're the oldest and most effective lobbyist <laughs> in the country. I guess that's probably right, yes. <laughs> Investment income from your you know, endowments and goodness knows what. I mean, there's a lot of money. We've been going 800 years, so it's been built up over that time. This is a, a, a heritage, and I think that's the right use of, of this pot of money, that it, it should be there to defend and promote the, the, the city in its broadest sense, financial services. For years, bankers have maintained that they are the cleverest people in Britain, and the politicians have believed them. 
In Britain, the revolving doors which propel bankers into government and government ministers and officials back into banking are almost unique. The assumption is that bankers are best. The danger is bankers and how they think have subtly captured the state. The movement from job to job amongst Britain's upper echelons is so familiar it's barely remarked upon. But in the past month alone, a former government minister, Ruth Kelly, has joined HSBC, and Sir James Sassoon, a former investment banker at UBS, has gone to a senior job in the Treasury. This revolving door brings advantages and disadvantages. You get a phenomenon called regulatory capture, where government, which is supposed to be there to protect the public interest, ends up being captured by sectional interests, by vested interests, perhaps by the big banks. And they end up being able to dictate policy uh, in a way which is not uh, conducive to the public interest. Last year, David Miller led a major study that looked at the revolving doors between government and banks for the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. We found that um, there was a huge amount of uh, connection there, that people had gone through the revolving door from government to the banks and back again with uh, uh, quite uh, an alarming uh, speed. The biggest banks had the most concentrated connections uh, and the countries which had the, the biggest connections were the UK, the US and Switzerland. And those connections are particularly pronounced when it comes to UKFI, the government organisation set up to represent the taxpayer shares in the nationalised banks. Its first chief executive, John Kingman, has recently gone from the Treasury to Rothschild's bank. Its first chairman, Philip Hampton, is now chairman of RBS. Its current chief executive, Robin Budenberg, was formerly at UBS, liaising with the Treasury. Revolving doors bring expertise, but also dangers. If you actually want a regulatory agency to properly regulate, uh, any industry. You don't bring in the people who are causing the problem to decide on whether there's a problem or not. You don't bring in the big oil companies, the big pharmaceutical companies, to sit on panels to judge how those companies' products should be regulated. In fact, you bring in independent people, scientists, and if, you, if they've got conflicts of interest in, in the case of science, they have to declare them. Coming up, the new government says it will get tough on the banks. But it's got a fight on its hands. These banks are too complex and too large to be managed. The collateral damage that's come out from this financial crisis has been huge, and the failure of doing the right policy could lead to the next uh, financial crisis and economic crisis. Despite the crash, the banks have fought off radical reform. Nothing can be done without international agreement, they argue. They know that international consensus for anything radical takes decades. But spinning things out so that as little as possible changes is unbelievably dangerous. The banks still pose an existential threat to Britain. They still lend 50 times more cash than they have, and they lend five times more than Britain produces in a year. That's why within the Bank of England there's so much concern there might be another crash and next time round the country simply couldn't afford the consequences. Something must change. In the heart of the City of London, opposite the Bank of England, stands the Mansion House, the Lord Mayor's official residence and banqueting hall. We could not be more pleased to have Paul Volcker as our guest. Today, the mayor is hosting a lunch for the man leading the case for reform in the United States. Paul Volcker, the 82-year-old former chair of America's Federal Reserve and President Obama's advisor on banks. What is all this elaborate financial system that built up over the last 10 or 20 years contributing to the welfare of our nations, contributing to the economy, contributing to productivity? Paul Volcker thinks that the banking system has to come back to earth. Banks should be split into those that serve customers and businesses and those that gamble clients' money in derivatives, what bankers call proprietary trading. Stop that and you close down the weakest link in the chain. And I think other people are in trouble too, so thank you for having me.
Is it business as usual or back to business as usual? Well, I think there's some tendency in the market to go back to business as usual, and that's a very dangerous tendency that has to be resisted, or I think we will end up in an even bigger financial crisis if we don't repair some of the, the structural faults in the present system. It's evident to you, it must be evident, that it can't go on as it has done, yet it seems to be going on. Well, in the short run, if you're making a lot of money, <laughs> you like to continue to make a lot of money, and the banks that I visualize, yes, they'll be dealing with consumers, they'll be dealing with businesses. They're, they're central institutions for big businesses, small businesses. They are central institutions for making payments all over the world and holding the, the global economy together. The distinction is between essential customer-related services and purely proprietary speculative activity. And that's the division? That's the division. I do think it's important or I, I wouldn't be pushing it. Volker's proposal for the future of global finance is one of many. There are proposals to levy a tax on bank profits to build up an insurance fund to raise banks' capital reserves, and to make derivative bets transparent by putting them on an open market. I think those are the toolkit of things that we can do, and almost certainly the correct answer is going to be not, as it were, one silver bullet out of that toolkit, but a combination of those. The big and dramatic change, though, is structural, to break up the banks in some way. Dispatches understands that recently the Bank of England's most senior officials have started to think in this way. Adam Posen is an external member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. If the banks are too big, they have too much political control, they have too much effect on competition, and they are too hard to understand and follow. We've set up at a minimum a far less efficient and competitive system than we should have. Uh, and we probably have set up vulnerability to the next crisis. I would take the banks that are currently nationalized or part nationalized, and I would break them into smaller pieces. They're too complex and too large to be managed, therefore I'm in favor of breaking them up. Even people who disagree with Paul Volcker on detail want to see Britain with more and smaller banks both so they're no longer too big to fail and to provide more choice for borrowers. The lack of competition and therefore the reduced choice in the banking market is a problem in our country. Four big banks uh, is rather like having you know, six big utility companies. Uh, you know, it, it's not enough. For the man in the street, for the public, I think more competition would be good. It doesn't seem sensible to have a tiny collection of banks that can hold a country to ransom. New entrants like Virgin and Tesco uh, and Santander can become a more significant force. I think we could do as much good by encouraging new banks in as breaking up uh, the large banks, although I think it's a fact of life that uh, separating Royal Bank of Scotland from NatWest or separating HBOS from Lloyds uh, would at this stage still be a relatively simple and straightforward exercise if we felt that was necessary in order to increase competition. But Labour in power was split over what to do and on top cowed by big finances threats. Now the coalition government is setting up a banking commission to advise on what to do. Why should it be any more determined? The coalition agreement is quite explicit. The purpose of this commission is to look at the separation of retail and investment banking. That's, that's our terms of reference. How we do that, over what time frame, how, whether you do this nationally or internationally, that, that kind of issue has, we have to pursue. But the, that is, is, a clear, is the clear direction in which we're going. The banks have had a hell of a kind regime over the last 30 or 40 years, the banks have virtually captured the state and now you're going to prize their hands off that control. Well certainly there was a great deal of complacency in government. 
uh, as I sometimes called it, pact with the devil. Uh, and it suited both sides. You know, the, uh, the banking system expanded the way it wanted, the government got its, got its tax revenue, and that suited, suited both of them. And there was no wish to confront the uncomfortable realities that were building up. But we've now had this crisis. We now look at the problem in a completely different way. British finance is a double menace. It threatens us with another financial Armageddon at the same time as it shamefully neglects British business. As our own research has shown, British banks direct money into property and derivative trading, but not into British business and entrepreneurship. We asked the big four British banks to give interviews for this film, but they all declined. If you want to see the damage the banks have done, visit Sandwell in the black country. The recession the banks have caused has hit this area hard. And now the banks are largely missing as companies struggle to get back on their feet. Sandwell's got about 20% of its economy based on manufacturing. By default, economic regeneration is left to Lyndon Bracewell from Sandwell Council. Lots of jobs were shed. Our unemployment rate, the Job Seeker Allowance Count, has gone up 89% through to its peak in January. Total unemployed is about 14,000. The council is doing what it can, but the odds are stacked against it. In the high street in Cradley Heath, it's been reduced to using window-sized photos to disguise empty shops. The banks have disengaged. It's both humiliating and desperate. Well, in terms of those that want to start a business, the banks really are not interested. They just see it as too high a risk. And even if you've got a good business plan, the rates they're charging now are anything 15 up to 20% interest. And for a lot of businesses, they just can't afford that amount of money. Rod Late's company splits steel from, amongst other things, precision springs, mostly for the car industry. It's a typical bedrock British manufacturing firm, largely shunned by banks. The rhetoric from the banks uh, that they are socially responsible and that they are making loans. It doesn't hang very well with us. The company is trapped. Its existing business lines are being pounded. The classic case for finance is to lend to enterprise. Vincent Cable vows to make that case stick. But how? What are your early ideas about how you will get banks to lend? Well, there's no s simple answer. I mean, it was very clear that the banks ran rings around the last government, despite the fact that the government owned the majority of the shares of RBS and a very substantial stake in the Lloyds Group. Uh, the banks continued pretty much as before. They were set rules, uh, which were actually legally binding, that were just cheerfully ignored. We've got to be tough in dealing with it. Banking systems are not products of nature. They are shaped by people and governments, because as we've seen, it's people and governments that stand behind them. So far, the banks have shaped the system as they want. The next 12 months are decisive, a short window of opportunity for us to shape the system as we want. And what we need is more banks, transparent banks and safer banks that really contribute to the British economy. It's as simple as that. The question is whether the government has the bottle to do it.